uh, Zoom know that we have you muted, uh, but we will at the end of this presentation open up for questions. Okay, good morning. So I'm gonna cover a little bit of the uh, background theory on spectroscopy in general, hopefully, theoretically. <laughs> so um, we are gonna go a little bit further into Raman and IR separately. So this is just for the, you know, to nice to know things. Um, the first slide is scary, but don't worry about it. <laughs> the point of this slide is when we are looking at visible light, there are a lot of phenomena are going on. And I am going to talk about a little bit about the absorption because it's related to um, colors we see. Actually, absorption, fluorescence, and phosphorescence are, in a way, you know, depending on the material, uh, uh, related to the colors we see, and which maybe in the future could we could utilize it to maybe quantify uh, the colors of the microplastic. So I'm just throwing it in there. So absorption. <clears throat> so absorption is actually used a lot in pharmaceutical to um, measure the concentration of the solutions, for example, right? So it follows the Lambert law. Um, for microplastic, um, it probably is more relevant that um, it can relate to the, uh, the absorption spectroscopy is relating to the colors that we see. Okay. So, for example, um, what did I write? <laughs> so, uh, if uh, the uh, plastic absorbs a certain uh, light, I mean, light of color, then the uh, color that appears to our eyes would be reverse color. Okay. Things like that. Um, and this is very, very, very simplified. Um, the schematic diagrams that uh, you know what uh, you would get in an instrument. And this is what we are, uh, for this week, this is what we will be uh, more focused on, it's a vibration spectroscopy. So IR absorption spectroscopy, <coughs> and um, that's, uh, so you use um, what uh, nowadays called mid IR. So there is a near IR, <laughs> there is a mid IR, and so on and so forth. So, um, uh, Suza will get into the details, but I think uh, typically 2,500 nanometers to 25,000 nanometers, and um, that's where um, this much of the um, light get, uh, is absorbed. So you, uh, you measure the light, and then you measure uh, the uh, light through the sample so that you, you know which part and how much of the light is absorbed. That's I asked that for Raman, you use a laser, um, and this is what we are going to look at. So these also show up in uh, Raman, but um, when someone says, I am doing Raman, without no uh, additional uh, uh, the notification, <coughs> it's usually this one, the Stokes spectrum. And as you can see, <coughs> you hit it with uh, light, and typically with a laser. And when it comes down, uh, when it comes down, it emits small portion of the light. It emits uh, light of the different wavelength. So you see the difference between incident beam and scalar beam, which happens to be the same energy, right? So we are actually looking at same vibrational modes. So that's why it's called vibration spectroscopy. Mm -hmm. and this is what we are looking at. So this is water. So this is called asymmetric stretching. It's doing asymmetric stretching, right? Mm -hmm. It's showing up somewhere like this. <coughs> asymmetric stretching, it shows up somewhere like this. So if you are looking at this spectrum and see this, oh, I think I have OH group in my molecule. So what molecule has, what polymer has OH group? Okay, that's how you go about it. This is also called OH to bending, so it's doing this, right? It shows up around here. Um, so when I see this, ooh, I must have, again, so this one, I must have a hydroxyl group, or I must have something like that, right? So then, what kind of molecules have that? So 
I study the spectra, study the vibration spectrum. You can um, recognize what kind of functional groups in there. And after long history of this kind of study accumulated over, so if you look at 1940s, 50s, 60s, 70s papers, it's all about this. I have this molecule, I studied it, I calculated, it, and its uh, spectrum looks like this, and they are relating to uh, seat stretching, weight stretching, um, you know, things like that, right? So now, those accumulated knowledge are in your Raman, data, uh, Raman or Arya databases, so you can do the search. But this is based on this kind of study. Okay. CO2, same thing. Oh, and the, um, I don't know if you heard uh, IR, and Raman, mm -hmm. IR spectroscopy and Raman spectroscopy are uh, usually uh, said complementary because they have a different selection rules. So, as you can see, uh, <clears throat> what's up here, what's strong in IR, tends to be weak in Raman. It's not 100%, but what's strong in IR, it tends to be weak in Raman. What's strong in Raman tends to be weak in IR. So, that's why we are studying both technologies this week, and that's uh, why it's called complementary. Okay. Um, so, as I said, this is what we are, uh, what, why we are studying vibrational spectroscopy. So, this is a polystyrene molecule, and CH, like, you know, uh, uh, CHR, one, two, three, substitution. It tends to show up CH stretching, and this is CH pink deformation. And then there's the CH2, and they show up here and here. And then aromatic group. So aromatic CH shows up here, and then wing is breathing like this and doing this, right? They show up here, here, here. So when you look at this entire spectrum, you go, aha, it's a polystyrene because I see aromatic grip, I, I, aromatic uh, wing, I see CH stretching, and so on and so forth, right? Now, again, you don't have to know this. You just know that these are basis of your database search. Okay? So. Um, and oh, these are just the terminologies. <clears throat> because this is where you get a lot of bands that's characteristic to each, uh, each molecule. Like, you know, aromatic groups, uh, CH2 bending, la 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 la. So it's called the fingerprint region. So if you read in a paper, people say fingerprint region, it's usually meaning up to about 1,800 or 2,000 wave numbers. Okay. Um, this is where it shows up CH. These are all CH. But then they also, uh, OH would show up here too. And our, uh, up MI, uh, like, amine groups, right? So NH stretching would show up somewhere here too. So sometimes I call it XH stretching region because it has, so mainly it's, uh, it's used to study CH, but it, it also shows OH and NH, okay? So that's the terminology that you see. Um, so this is a time, uh, the uh, uh, schematic diagrams. Um, again, we will go, um, a little bit further in details about this. So you, you see it is a little bit different. Um, so uh, in IR absorption spectroscopy, um, you have a polychromatic light, and then um, you have a spectrometer, so you can scan it. Um, and you, so instruments can come with a microscope, or it doesn't have to have a microscope, so it can have either way. And then you get you through. You go through the sample, and you uh, get the detector, and determ uh, to uh, determine how much of light is observed at what wavelength. So this IR absorption spectroscopy. Rama is a little bit different. You have a light source, and it should be monochromatic. And that monochromatic light is usually laser. That laser wavelength can be usually visible and near IR, but it can be UV as well. And then it goes to, uh, again, you can have an instrument that, uh, that has a microscope or you don't, you can have an instrument that doesn't have a microscope. The systems you will be using um, uh, this week for the training, it is a microscope. And then it hits the sample, it, uh, it uh, generates a uh, scattering photons, which is now go through the spectrometer. And then 
it gets how uh, you know how much of a scattering photons I can I can see at what uh, wavelength. That's how you do the Raman. And this is benzene spectra. Uh, oh, other thing. So if you look at IR spectra, it usually goes from 4,000 and down to the right. Okay, that's convention. So if you look at the uh, spectral axis. If you look at Raman spectrum, convention is we start going from zero to 4,000. So you will see that um, it tends to be the other way around in the spectral axis. I'm a Raman person. <laughs> I'm a Raman person from, uh, you know, from everywhere. So my spectrum will always have a Raman convention, but it's just a you know, convention of the uh, convention and preference of it. So these are some of the um, some of the like you know terminologies and conventions of how the uh, the uh, intensity and spectral wavelength comes out. Here is something oh, I wanted to uh, point out. So we are throwing we will be and are throwing a lot of information for you today. <coughs> so um, if you would like to get the uh, copy of uh, electronic uh, copy of these presentations, just send me an email and I'll send you the link and you can. Yeah. Okay. Hey. Anyway. <coughs> so, um, the in terms of spectral axis, uh, IR absorption spectroscopy is more straightforward. Um, you have a wavelength, and then um, you uh, but you express the wavelength in wave numbers. Okay. So that's the uh, IR spectroscopy. In Raman, it's a little bit more complicated because if you uh, remember, like you know five slides back, you hit the sample with a laser. So for example, 530 nanometer laser. And then uh, sample get excited and emits a scattering, Raman scattering photons, which is a little bit different from the laser wavelength. So it would be, I don't know, 535 nanometers. Then what you are looking at is the shift difference. So you are looking at two nanometer shift, okay? Now, those shift is now then converted to wave number. So the uh, spectral axis of the uh, Raman spectrum is usually labeled as Raman shift because it's looking at the uh, shift in wavelength in wave number. So that's why it's a little bit um, uh, uh, complicated. Uh, for IR absorption spectroscopy, you are dealing with uh, transmittance, which can be converted into obs uh, observance. In Raman, you are dealing with the scattering, uh, uh, scattering uh, intensity. So in Raman, if you have no signal, you get zero counts. Mm. Theoretically, <laughs> you get a zero. And then if you have a strong intensity, you get high counts. In IR, if you have no signal, you get 100% transmittance, zero absor observance. And then, and then you get the uh, uh, reverse logarithm in reverse. Um, so complementary, uh, polystyrene. So you can see, as I said, having IR and Raman spectrum of polystyrene could give you better identification or you know confirmation and cross validation, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. This is polyethylene. You can see that um, peaks. This is uh, strong in Raman, not so much. There is a very sharp band here. It's not really in it. So you can see that the uh, by over uh, by taking both of the spectra, you can see more information, and also it's, it works as if it's a cross validation. Right? That's why it's called <coughs> complementary. Ah, so that's the spectroscopy, and I'm going to talk about a little bit about the other technology that you can. Potentially use, and I talk about microscopy because of the systems we will be using uh, this week will uh, have microscopes. So um, you will be, you know, dabbling uh, 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 a little bit into the microscopy. So in microscopy, <coughs> there is something called, you know, bright field. Bright field is a straightforward microscopy. You hit it with the light, you take a look at it, you magnify it with the objective lens. That's a bright field microscopy. So if someone says nothing about microscopy, it's usually bright field microscopy. 
Now, there is something called the dark field microscopy, which you will uh, use uh, at least for Raman this week, is when you have a bright field microscopy, sometimes because you are, no matter how well you do the alignment, the, uh, the center usually is very bright. So what they do is that they block the center. So you, you get oblique, like you know, the, the uh, illumination coming from the side. That's dark field microscopy. So we are gonna try that this way, okay? And there is a something called the polarized light microscopy. So sunglasses. So when you have a glares, when you have cross polarized uh, uh, the, uh, the, the polarized uh, the, uh, sunglasses, you can cut off the glares and you can see better, right? So it's kind of like that. So there's a something called the polarized light microscopy. Now again, I'm not a microscopy person. I'm a Raman person, so. I know microscopy just enough so that I can uh, get good Raman experiment, right? Mm -hmm. So I do have, uh, I do, pro I did pro bring um, polarized light uh, accessories for the microscope, so you guys can take a look at it. Um, we will, if we will have time, we will try it, but I cannot guarantee. <laughs> so, but that's uh, polarized, uh, polarized light microscopy. So you put one polarization in the, uh, the white light and then cross polarization to the um, observation. So it could be binocular for your eyes or it could be digital camera. Okay? So that's a prize light microscopy. And the, uh, the point of this light is that you do not have any wavelength discretion. So absorption, all of them. Fluorescence, all of them. Phosphor phosphorescence, all of them are coming to a, you know, all photons together. That's what you see. And there is something called the spectral imaging, which is a little bit, the terminology is a little bit uh, misfortunate because um, uh, it came from uh, remote sensing. When I say remote sensing, literally, you know, satellite people. So it means when you have discrete wavelength. So actually, color camera we, we use, it is a spectral imaging because it has a red filter, green filter, and blue filter which is red wavelength, I think it's a 600 something, green filter 500 something, they put color filters that select certain wavelength. And that's what you, uh, what you get to see. So instead of getting all photons, you select a certain spectral position. That's spectral uh, uh, imaging. <coughs> so color camera is one of the simplest spectral imaging. And then there's something called epifluorescence. Um, so it's the same thing, but more, uh, I'd say, better, better developed, uh, because it's uh, developed by microscopy people. So what they have is, a, again, color filter, but uh, better quality, better controlled, better defined. So it can go into the uh, excitation, uh, the uh, light source, it can go into the absorption path or in both. And um, this is very popular when they uh, study, like, you know, uh, cell biology, like you know, tissue studies and things like that. So that's called uh, the uh, spectral imaging. And then nowadays, um, there is a something called the hyperspectral imaging microscopy. And I emphasize it is a microscopy because <clears throat> when you are doing Raman mapping or IR mapping, or nowadays it's called the Raman imaging and IR imaging, it is also hyperspectral imaging because it is getting X, Y and spectral information. And if the spectral information is Raman, it's a Raman hyperspectral imaging. If it is IR, it is IR spectral, uh, IR hyperspectral <laughs> imaging. And if it is combined, if there is no discretion, so you know all the lights combined but separated in wavelength only, then you can think of it as Raman uh, hyperspectral microscopy, right? What what good is it? It helps with the contrast. It helps with the contrast. It helps with separating subtle differences, maybe in colors, subtle differences, maybe in you know reflection type of thing. So it helps with the contrast. Okay. And then, so bright field, dark field, bright field, and dark field. So these are the uh, actually the samples you guys worked on in October with Kina and Hannah, and that's how it looks different. How, how different it looks, okay? So I found bright field is very uh, useful when I'm actually you know, find, trying to find the target, and it, because it comes out like this, 
But then once I find the target and try to you know, examine my target, I find the talk field is a lot better. So it's, we are gonna try a little bit. Okay, we are gonna try a little bit back and forth. Oh, and um, there is a something called elemental analysis. Now, um, elemental, uh, um, there are obviously multiple technologies, one of which is called X-ray energy dispersive X-ray fluorescence. Okay? It uses high, high power, high energy uh, uh, light, such as high energy X-ray, or sometimes even electron beams. So what it does is that it hits the uh, core electrons and emits uh, X-ray, and those X-ray, so this is important, so forget about the process. <laughs> important thing is when you do the uh, X-ray uh, fluorescence, what you get is, let's say I have, uh, I, have um, I have RM, then I would get certain specific X-ray beams. Um, if I have a calcium, I get very specific X-ray beams. So, what they tell you is what element is in your sample. Now, polymers themselves are usually, you know, mostly made of carbons and hydrogen. So it may not be very useful to differentiate polyethylene from, from polystyrene. However, here is something I want to, uh, uh, I want to, uh, like, you know, uh, actually throughout this this week we want to talk about is the difference between pure sample and pristine sample, okay? Pure sample. I can order, uh, I can order pure uh, polyethylene from Aldrich, and it will <laughs> come with, I mean, everything, you know, at, in, in the bottle, everything will be polyethylene, that's it, right? I can do the same thing with the polystyrene. So those are pure samples. But, this is, let's say I borrow brand new. This is a plastic. It is usually cut the mixture and compositions of multiple ingredients. It could have polyethylene layer, it could have PT layer for the surface treatment, it could have the pigments for the coloring, it could have like plasticized additives, etc. It hasn't gone through weathering yet. So it can be pristine sample. And what we are probably get in the environment is weathered products. So we probably want to study pristine samples as well as pure samples, right? And pristine samples, because we want to know where the pollution is coming from, what kind of pollution is in there, and products would have additives. And additives would have uh, the more than carbons and hydrogens, hydrogens, right? So it may have certain pigments that has characteristic of the certain uh, product which may have iron or titanium, and those would be um, easily detectable <coughs> with this kind of elemental analysis. So this is for kind of, you know, in the, as we go and uh, further and further in the research and uh, um, the uh, analytical research, this may, uh, oops, this may, they, they, this te these technologies may become useful. So I just wanted to keep you guys that these are available. Oh, and then, of course, mass spectrometry. Okay. So, um, the mass spectrometry is being used for with the pyrolysis and GC, etc. Right? So, mass spectrometry. That's it. Any questions? Any questions?